Welcome to Bits of Signum, a podcast that dives into the intersection of gaming, AI, and Web3. In each episode, we host titans of innovation and thought leadership, and we cover the many new online economies and technologies that are bubbling up in the metaverse. The conversations explore new business models with the leaders who are shaping the future. I'm your host and founder of Signum Growth, Angela Dalton. And I'm your co-host and Web3 analyst at Signum Growth, Evan Castelli. Welcome back, everyone. Very excited to be here with the founder and president of Come To Us US, Hugh Lee. Uh, Evan and I are really excited to have this conversation because it's pretty rare that we get to talk to someone who's very deep in gaming with a very long history uh, in the gaming space and a very long history in the Web3 space. We would love for you to start, Hugh, by just giving us your background and go back to the beginning of come to us and then, <laughs> and then walk us through also how the web, how web three got woven in here. Hi, my name is Q Lee and I'm the president of come to us USA. So come to us right now is actually a combination of two companies. Uh, there are two leading mobile game companies in South Korea. One was called Gameville. The other was called come to us. Actually Gameville acquired come to us and rebranded it, uh, the company as come to us. Uh, so I was, uh, one of the co-founders of, uh, Gameville and, um, we, you know, we were a startup uh, that started from Seoul national university. So, uh, the graduates, uh, from Seoul national university, we thought, um, building a new company would be exciting and, um, game was a hot topic back then. So we were thinking. Oh, let's build a uh, game company. And uh, we looked at the space, uh, online gaming was starting. So we we did some, a little bit of lo- online gaming. But the more interesting thing that we did was uh, we were one of the first uh, mobile game companies in the world. So uh, yes, LG Telecom, uh, I think they, they were the first to launch uh, a Java-based uh, platform in South Korea. And we were one of the first content providers uh, to service on their uh, platform. That is very exciting. I have to say before this call, I had to laugh because Evan asked, what is WAP? Can you talk <laughs> about your roots <laughs> there? Yeah. I had, for the record, a WAP phone when they came out um, yes. and I had the little tiny screen and it, and I remember running around and telling my colleagues, this is so cool. You can play games and read the New York Times. And it was this little tiny strip in black and white <laughs> on the phone. Right. But can you just talk about that? Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, before there was color, there was black and white. And before there were so images, uh, it was all text-based. Uh, so there were WAP games, this WAP, Wireless Application Protocol, and you would just basically give instructions, you know, like move left, move right, or choose this door, choose that door. And based off your selections, uh, the outcomes would be different. And that was basically a game back then. And then the snake type of game. <laughs> <And the snakes. laughs> <laughs> Remember all of the Nokia. That is so yeah. great. <laughs> but yeah, we, we did, you know, looking back, we did tremendous things on those uh, small screens. And I think we built the first role-playing game on that. And we, wow. uh, the, the amount of uh, memory uh, that was given on the mobile device was so small that we had to, like, we, it was almost like mach- machine language uh, coding that we had to do. Mm. Um, with with Java uh, to to make that happen, but it was it, yeah, it was really fun. Wow. So you were there really early. What, tell yeah. us about that. I mean, that was that had to have been a grind for the yes, first it was a, maybe even many years. Yes, it was a big gr- grind, and um, you know, well, but we were also students too, and we didn't we didn't need a lot of uh, money. We didn't have a family that we had to support. I remember, I think my first paycheck uh, at the company was like $700 a month or something like that. And, uh, Mm -hmm. but, but yes. And, and I started out as a backend engineer. Uh, I studied physics in college and I was, uh, I was going to move into computer science and uh, that's when I joined the company. And uh, yes, I did a lot of uh, web, web development, database programming, and also game server programming back in the day. So for the company, Mm. Uh, but yes, we did a lot of uh, work for hire for other um, conglomerates uh, like 
they would want, they would have an internet portal and they would want to have a small like mini game section uh, within their portal. And we would do work mm. for hire, hire for that. Um, a lot of the, uh, the money that we're generating off of mobile games back then, I think lifetime revenue would be in the tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> so, wow. So it was a very small industry, but it was very exciting because we were always believing, uh, you know, like you want to play games everywhere. You don't want to play on, only on, on your de desktop. So, and the devices are going to get better and better every year. And, uh, you know, the mobile era will eventually come. But it actually took us like eight years, up all the way to 2008, um, until like the App Store mm -hmm. really, really opened the gates. And then, you know, all of a sudden we were servicing like maybe one or two countries. And with the App Store, we're servicing to 150 different countries around the world. Uh, the, the phones became so much better. And we were providing such a better experience to the users. The menus, the app store itself, you know, compared to mm. the, the old uh, carrier days, you know, in the carrier days, you would only look at the text and your right. position, where you were ranked on that menu meant uh, equal pretty much to the revenue that you were generating. So, and it was really hard for a, a good content creator um, to show that you have good content. You know? So, but I think... With, a, with the App Store, uh, that became much more easier. Um, us uh, coming from South Korea, trying to break in through the global market, uh, I think it was very important that, the, um, that we had the capabilities for our content to speak for itself. And when the App mm -hmm. Store came around, uh, we had two games called Baseball Superstars and Zenonia. Uh, they immediately shot to the top of the charts because the users recognized uh, the quality of the games that we were developing. And yeah, I, I remember, I think we were, then we started making like hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. from each of, of, of these games. And, and our company went public uh, and yes, so we've been growing ever since. One of, the, one of the big disconnects for us between crypto and gaming or you know, Web three and gaming is this idea of time spans. Um, gaming oriented people are used to uh, longer time frames for content creation, um, you know, for delivery of product, uh, and uh, just generally the, the the cycles are are a little bit longer. And then you were in the mobile space very very early, so you had that kind of double understanding. Can you? Talk to us about Web3 uh, and, you know, you also uh, continue to build in Web3 through this mm -hmm. crypto winter and would love to just hear when you got started, how you got started and, and just, mm -hmm. you know, how you see it going into the future and you know, moving into the future. We're in the business of uh, creating, uh, playing with digital assets. That's, that's what we do in, uh, in, on all the games that we service uh, on the app store. So it's only it only makes sense that we're very interested in digital assets, and um, so we saw we saw what was happening with like Crypto Kitties. We thought it was too early. We, we were pushing it away for a while because we thought it was too early. But then we were thinking, you know, it's we feel like it's coming, so we should um, get involved in some way. And what's the best way for us to um, get introduced to Web three? I think uh, the first step. From a user's point of view, is the is the crypto exchange. Uh, so we thought we should invest into. We had we came by an opportunity to invest into the third largest crypto exchange in South Korea. It's called Coin One. We currently own thirty eight percent, and we're the second large shareholder of of that exchange. But we invested to Coin One to learn more and build some connections. In. And but what really like. Um, made us um, get really interested is when MBA uh, introduced the MBA Top Shot and when Axie Infinity uh, came came uh, uh, came to the market, we were, uh, Sky Mavis came with Axie Infinity. That's when we really thought, oh, we've got to take this really seriously because we we currently have a, a game called Summoner's War. It's a, it's a mobile game. It's a turn-based uh, role-playing game based off of collecting um, heroes within the game. 
And we also have the number one baseball game on the app store right now called MLB Nine Innings. And it's basically about collecting all of these uh, players uh, to play with the game. And so, and when we looked at NBA Top Shot and we looked at Axie Infinity, we thought if NBA Top Shot right now is just NFT collection, but if they come out with a great game component uh, to it, or if, if uh, Axie Infinity, you know, it was, it's a very simple uh, turn-based game, but if it becomes more advanced like Summoner Wars War in, in the future, this is going to be a, a tremendous threat to our existing business is the way that we looked at it. So it wasn't really us like thinking, oh, we got we to gotta move forward. It, it, it was more of like, we have to protect our business too, you know, because mm. if you were given the same game, one uh, same quality game, and one has true ownership uh, of the digital assets uh, within the game, and one doesn't. Which one would you play? You know, common sense. You know, I think it, you would you would play the game uh, where where digi di digital asset ownership is given to you. So, so that's when we uh, thought, oh, this is going to be the future. We have to protect our business. This is how free to play is going to evolve to the next stage. So. Um, so we got really serious and uh, from the top down decision, we thought, um, you know, we were first in mobile, we had strong conviction there. Uh, we were first into free to play because free to play was the same question. Do you want to play a paid app or do you want to play a free app? Free app is common sense, you know, so after free to play, the next team is going to be with three and, uh, we have to take this really seriously and we have to enforce this for every single studio within our company to, build on Web3 from now on. When we also looked at the market and we thought, saw um, the user experience that was given, it was, it, was, it's, it was a really bad broken experience. You know, like you had to, mm -hmm. you had to purchase NFTs upfront. You had to have a, a crypto exchange account. You had to have wallets and all of these. So we wanted to make it much more seamlessly from the beginning. So when we were creating our um, Web3 platform, our thought process is, you know, the users will have to play the game just like they're playing right now. You know, they play the game and as they get more immersed, as they own more digital assets within the game, and when owner be ownership becomes more important to them, when they have more attachment to the actual um, digital assets within the game, that's when we introduced Web3. It was our approach. So. Our approach um, from the beginning last year, we were saying we're going to do a Web 2.5 approach. Uh, and I think there were great terms saying like Web 2.5 is Web 2 and Web 3, so it should be Web 5, you know. Or, but um, that was our approach. But everybody else said that doesn't make sense. You know, why do you do that when you could do NFT sales upfront, collect millions of followers, and mm -hmm. then build a, build a community around your true believers? If you had a very short-term uh, approach to this, uh, that could make more sense. Uh, or if you're a startup where cash flow is very important, that could make sense. Uh, so I'm not really blaming uh, companies that made those decisions, but um, from from a company like us, uh, we we're in this for a very long term, and we already have a huge user base in Web two that we have to educate and we have to convert. And we can't shove this down to our user base because they're all gonna, uh, uh, they're gonna resist, you know? So we, we wanted to take the step-by-step -step approach to our users and gradually over, move, move them over. It may take, uh, it may take two or three years. It may take nine or 10 years, but, you know, we wanted to get a sense of where the users are and move them according to the pace that they're willing to move. And uh, mm -hmm. so, and that's the approach uh, with all of our games. So all of our games that we launched um, starting from the end of last year, we, we've been launching as a Web 2.5 game. So, and the game will be, the games are distributed through the app store. Um, you, you don't need any crypto uh, at the beginning. Uh, um, and later on, as you play, you'll meet some elements uh, where this is this is actually a token, or this is an uh, actually an NFT. And uh, 
that's the way that we we're approaching this mm. stuff right now. Hugh, that makes so much sense. When we met, talked about this idea of players not really knowing uh, that blockchain was in the game, uh, no wallet. And you mentioned kind of there's a maybe a 10% guideline, 10% of the game. Is that something that you're, um, is that kind of the way you're thinking about it? And over what time period will you increase that percentage? And then how will people get wallets and find out that they really are playing this Web3 game? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really interesting, you know, because um, yeah, right now. So if 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 the total in-game economy is about a hundred, um, say, um, we're starting with like a small percentage, like ten percent, uh, right now. And over time, because these games aren't like single products; these are services, and we do a lot of live operation. We add on to add on a lot of more components over time. So this ten percent over time could grow into 30%, up to 50% or something like that in the future. And because the gamers within our ecosystem become, as, as they become more familiar to this, um, when we launch our newer games, like next year or the following year, we won't start at 10%. We could start at 20, 30% and then grow that piece over time. So there's no specific number. Um, what we tell our production teams is that I don't care how much it is, but you have to put some. You know, we have to put some element in there. And it's very interesting, you know, to even see our internal teams, you know, there's a lot of resistance now in, in adopting it too, because they're mm -hmm. like, you know, our users may not be happy because uh, they're they're seeing this Web3 element in, in it, you know, or, and, or, and even from our users, they're like, just let me pay, you know, why, why are you making me go through these steps? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't need the ownership, you know, <laughs> right now, but, but, mm. but so, so it is an education phase, not only to, it's also internal education, it's also external education, but, um, but we know everybody knows it's going there, but in order to go mm -hmm. there, you have to break down, break it down into pieces, uh, pieces or steps that that everybody's willing to move forward. And I think that's what's missing right now in, in the Web3 mm -hmm. space because everything's such a quick grab. Uh, so everything feels like a scam. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and there's so, neg so much negativity right now, but that's what we wanna mm -hmm. change. And we wanna, we wanna um, do this the right way with a very long-term approach. Hmm. It's so great that you're in this space because I think the the inclination of most players is this is a money grab. I don't need your money grab in my game. I just I'm just here to have fun. And then lo and behold, the first kind of experimenters in the space ended up doing that a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now the skepticism is really high. And I think that tapping into this behavior that that gamers already have, which is collection and the inclination to, to ownership is super powerful over time. So it's great that you're educating them very slowly because I think that is the way to win with gamers. Yes. Back in the days when when we were when we were kids, you know, um, if you ask uh, what do you want as a as a gift, that we every you know, we wanted toys, right? But um, mm -hmm. nowadays if you ask kids, they want like Roblox gift cards. And so, yep. um, <laughs> yeah, we, so, it's obvious that our kids are about the same age. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So they want digital assets. Uh, they don't want physical assets. And like with Apple's announcement yesterday, we, we see that like the amount of time, like we're doing this over Zoom like, and I probably spend at least five, six hours on Zoom every day, but the amount of time that I'm spending in the digital space is increasing so much year over year. And I think the next generation will be uh, just full of um, uh, time that there's living in the digital space. So it's very important to give ownership into the digital asset um, that, that they have. You're gonna want to share the assets that you that you owned in every single game to your friends within the digital space. You know, like how are you gonna show that to them? If you're not living in an interoperable world, or if you can't prove that to the other people, um, and if you can't move that among uh, 
different digital spaces, you know, uh, you, you can't do this uh, through a centralized technology. And I think um, that's where blockchain um, is essential uh, to the future. And uh, I think the next generation totally gets it. Uh, it's, it's, it's the older generation like us who don't get it. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, Mm -hmm. But but yeah. but but we're in that education phase, and, and and there's so many experiences that I look back where I feel like, oh, for the younger generation, it it, it makes so much more sense. When Minecraft first came out, and we were playing it on the iP iPad, older generation people said, "How are you going to control with your fingers with through a touch interface?" And now nobody questions that. Yeah. And, um, Mm -hmm. so I think it's very similar, you know, so um, it's it's so obvious that everything is moving to, to the digital space and this is the future. And uh, we we want to be uh, one of the pioneers in this space. And, and that's actually when our business grew. Like every time uh, when our actual business grew is when these type of technological breakthroughs happen and when we were on the forefront of it. Um, we had already we're laid the groundwork. Yes. And we're already the, you have to be the insider group of it right in the world. And, uh, so uh, that's, that's exactly where we want to position ourselves right now. And, uh, and I think um, time will come. And I think even in the business perspective, we will harvest. <laughs> So part of where Come to Us has positioned itself is in the Xpla ecosystem and the Come to Verse. Uh, would mm -hmm. you be able to just give a like a brief, you know, auditory diagram of how those relate to each other and what the the overall Web three vision is? So um, Xpla is a decentralized uh, uh, chain that Come to Us was a uh, Genesis contributor to, and. Uh, our thought process, um, it, it's a Cosmos tendermint uh, based chain, but our thought process was we want to build a chain that's for content creators themselves. You know, it's a chain, it's a content focused chain built by content creators. And when we looked at all of the other chains out there, I think they're much more gener generic in a lot of sense. Right now, we're at a similar starting line. So that's why when you look at all of the layer ones around you, they all look similar because they're all at the very early stage of development. But over time, as we become, as we're content focused and as we be build more and more content specific tools and ecosystems, we think every chain, every layer one will start looking very different. And that's where we want to look significantly different. We want, we want to be the friendliest, uh, chain to content um, developers. Uh, we want it to provide the best experience to the content con consumers. And um, yeah, so, so um, that's that's what we want to do in the future. So come to us as, has a 10 year agreement with Xpla to continuously support Xpla. So it's a content contributor. And uh, come to verse. Is a is a metaverse. It's like Zoom on steroids, uh, but right, the metaverse that we're building out uh, with a lot of the other Korean con conglomerates. But that metaverse will actually use uh, Expo as its chain on on the back end. So that's how the three of them uh, relate to each other. I think most of our audience probably has a good idea of how gaming integrates with blockchain, but content is less talked about. Are there any applications today that you see being able to directly port into come to verse? Like, is it content in the sense of TikTok going onto the blockchain and people being to interact in new ways? Or is it more like mm. celebrities have their own personal show or, um, you know, store and Roblox where they can interact with their fans? What is it? What does that aspect look like? So when, when I mention content, it's actually about um, the whole entertainment business outside of gaming. So mm -hmm. TV, film, uh, webtoon, animation, even K-pop, you know, we call this content. But come to us, um, we had a very strong conviction that all of these Korean uh, local content developers will become global players. You know, they'll become unicorns in the future because... Netflix is doing exactly the same thing that the App Store did to, to all of the game companies back then. So, so these content um, creators right now, they're really small shops, uh, probably in the tens of or hundreds of millions of valuations. But I think there's going to be many, many unicorns that happening in the future from Korea. So we decided to pub, um, acquire a publicly listed uh, 
content company called Wizwick Studios, and they've been rolling up a lot of content underneath that. So it's it's a group of like almost like thirty companies now. Because we are uh, we're also controlling uh, their shares, you know, we're we've been giving them a mission that you also have to create for the export chain. And uh, so um, they're in the very slow adoption phase, you know, even gaming companies, mixing mixing gaming company and these entertainment company is a hard job. That's why transmedia mm. takes so long too, but we're, we're on the mission to make that happen and bring all of these digital assets over to Expo. Um, it's very long-term play, uh, but we're getting them started. Like we, we created the number one TV show in, in, in Korea last year, it was called Reborn Rich, and we're actually bringing some of their NFTs over to Explosion already. The Korea is already very influential in broader Asian culture, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, I think it's it's becoming the Asian Hollywood right now. So, and 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 I and I think it has to do a lot with. Uh, I have to thank Netflix uh, and Disney Plus a lot for that reason too. But, but you know, because because Netflix, you know, they were focused around the U.S. and English speaking audience at at the beginning. But as they wanted to grow their subscriber base, you know, they needed to they needed to expand more into Asia. Uh, the best way to expand mm -hmm. for them to expand into Asia is um, creating more content that's engaging to the Asian audience. And, mm -hmm. and and when they looked at Asia and they looked at where the content can come from, you know, they started noticing that oh, Korea has a great content. Mm -hmm. uh, Develop, they have a great pool of content developers there. So Netflix actually invested significantly into the number one uh, content uh, creator called uh, Studio Dragon. Uh, and I Let's think see. they're doing they're doing about 10 shows a year. And because Netflix is going out there and expanding their network, like all of the other uh, um, OTT platforms, streaming platforms have to follow and chase that. Mm -hmm. So there's huge competition and demand for Korean content because they know that Korean content resonates so well in every mm -hmm. single territory around Asia. Mm -hmm. And and um, Blackpink won the Grammy, right? For uh, yes. the top metaverse <laughs> performer. <laughs> and so that really has kind of global appeal. Yes, yes. So um, yeah, I think Asia is very exciting, and I think we have we have a lot of uh, great content creators, and I and I think it has to do with the the amount of criticizing that the Korean community does to all mm -hmm. of its content creators. You know, we have, we're leveling up ourselves because of our consumers' taste <laughs> level. But uh, but that's been great uh, to the whole business. And yes, yeah, so I think there's a tremendous amount of talent. Can you talk about being a publicly traded company and how that uh, has influenced your entry into Web3, entry into the in, entry into these other businesses? I mean, I would think that would be a pretty challenging, you know, obstacle to overcome in in terms of the regulatory backdrop. Yes. Um, yes. So um, I think we take pride. Uh, that our chain has been uh, audited from the very, from the top, from the top auditing firms of every, from the first block that we generated, it, just mm. because we are a public company, uh, we like the Korean government's also very involved in in all of these. You know, they're keeping a very close eye onto all of um, everything that's happening in Web three, everything that's happening in. In, in, in the public uh, company space and we're in the intersection of that. So um, we naturally have to be extremely conservative and compliant in order to even just maintain our business. And so sometimes uh, it, it may look like that we're running really slow, but a lot of times it's because we're, very, we're being extremely cautious not to set the wrong tone, and we mm. we want to be we want to make sure that we're on the right side. Yeah, you know, and we don't have like short term goals that we have to hit. We have a very mm -hmm. long term view in in Web three. It only makes sense that we follow um, the necessary steps. You know, so we we want to create this chain of Expo, which is uh, we want it to be a decentralized chain. We want every content creator to be. 
the owner of the chain, that may have conflict with uh, with our shareholders too. So you know, our shareholders want want the best of us. You know, we we think the best way to deliver best interest for shareholders is to have a very long term play, and even though we have a small piece of it, make it a very big play. And uh, and uh, fortunately, um, our investors have been very understanding uh, with what we've been doing. But the str struggle is there. You know, we always uh, face those type of two, the token holders and, and the shareholders not having always the exactly same point of view on every single thing. But the shareholders own the amount of tokens that the company owns. And uh, we decided to come to a matched number that can happen, uh, that can balance the, the interest of both. Uh, so, in terms of launching Exfla, how did you or the Come To Us team and everyone involved ensure that the chain was decentralized and ensure that going forward, um, you know, all the upgrades, et cetera, can be made decentralized? We, we have a lot of validators right now. We have uh, 40 validators uh, uh, that are validating the chain. And these are, we, we intentionally didn't want all of the validators to be all of our allies too. And uh, so um, we, 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 you know, Jump is a, a investor of us and they've been a great partner for us. And they actually introduced us to all of the validators that are validating um, the wormhole. And uh, so they, they all came on board uh, to secure the chain. So I think um, that's been very healthy in a very decentralized point of, point of view. As I mentioned before, uh, we came to that magic number of uh, owning not too much of, of the chain uh, and owning a small percentage of the chain. And uh, and I think uh, that also shows uh, the intent we're going in that dis uh, direction of decentralization. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so much fun to hear your perspective because then on one hand, I'm hearing... Um, you know, we're conservative, we want to move slowly, we want to do everything kind of, you know, for the long term. And then on the other hand, you take a lot of risks in terms of early experimentation, even back in, you know, 1998 and mobile and early to Web3. Uh, and also your role specifically, Q, is pretty unusual in that you're a founder, uh, you're, you know, working on this Web3 initiative, you work on the investment side of the business as well. And it's, it's just, it's really exciting because you have, it seems like a pretty interesting balance. I found out from one of our earlier conversations that another thing we have in common is that we're both, uh, I'm from Kansas, uh, I know you <laughs> lived in Kansas. <laughs> Can you just give us a little personal view into you know, where and how you grew up and how all of this came together to lead to these various skills you have? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think Kansas is a great place to have, to think a lot and have a very long, long term <laughs> point of view on mm. many, many things. Uh, I think I was fortunate that um, my, my, my dad was a, a PhD in mathematics, and uh, that's why he he landed in uh, in in Kansas. But I he think, was it was he a professor at University yeah. of Kansas? Uh, oh. No, no, he he did his, uh, he he got his degree there, uh, and then he okay. became a professor in South Korea. But uh, the the mathematics uh, influence uh, that I got uh, from him. And the fact that I, I spoke, uh, Eng I learned English while I was there. I was there uh, six years as a kid. And then I grew up uh, back in Korea again. But I think uh, the English that I learned from there, that combination was a gr gave me a great start. Uh, that's why I, was, I, I had general interest in math, I had general interest in physics, I had general interest in computer science. And... Um, and because I was exposed to so many things uh, that were happening outside of Korea, you know, I think I had a, I had a very uh, global point of view early on. You said math, physics, and computer science, and I thought that you were uh -huh. going to say art or something, some creative <laughs> uh, discipline as well, because you definitely strike me as a real balance between a creative and a and a, and a, you know, kind of math, science, physics person as well. <laughs> uh, well, uh, thank you for thinking me of, but I don't have anything in art, actually. I think the closest that I can to art is, um, is the fact that I'm working in the game industry. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, but, but, but I love um, working um, in the forefront of all of these uh, 
te technological advancements. And, uh, and uh, I think in order to keep, uh, keep moving and keep yourself interested and keep driving, I think it's very important to take a lot of risk. History says so much about how you have to move forward in the technical space. I think I'm a big believer in the innovator's dilemma, you know, and I think that's mm. what, that's why all of the companies keep getting old, you know, and I think uh, uh, you have to keep yourself young, you know, not, not only yourself, but you have to keep your company young. And yeah. in order to do that, you have to keep disrupting yourself. And, and uh, Web3 is the biggest uh, disruption that I've ever seen. So mm. uh, that's why we're so excited uh, about Web3 right now. I have to ask the obligatory AI question. How yeah. do you think AI will play into games, into Web3? Uh, Open-ended question. Yeah, that, that's such a big topic, right? Uh, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, just thinking in a gaming uh uh, developers pers perspective uh, or running a game company you know there's there's so many media things that um, AI could help us uh, just on our operational level on increasing the productivity I think those are like really low-hanging fruits that will be applied immediately uh, where it really gets interesting is um, is where um, AI combines with um, the metaverse uh, or how content is created uh, in the future. And, you know, I think there's going to be significant amount of uh, personalized content uh, in the future. So I think every gamer, when they're playing a game right now, they're having the same experience. It's, but I think uh, you'll be given uh, such different type of experiences, even for single player games uh, through the assistance of, uh, of math. Um, um, the construction of these worlds, each of these gamers are playing within, um, are going to play out so differently in the future. And, and that's what really gets me excited. And then I think, what's the role of a uh, game designer in that person? And, and I think it's it's more, it's going to be more about the world, uh, uh, world building or the character building. It's going to completely change uh, what a game means. And it's, it's going to be more like living in a virtual world or living in a in a, in a metaverse uh, in the future. There's going to be a lot of uh, different uh, storytelling to be done. Very, very exciting. Yeah. So Q, thank you so much for taking all of this time to come speak to us on the podcast. But we'll be in Boston together soon and uh, hosting a brainstorm with Q to talk about um, Come to Us, Web3, AI, uh, games, all of these topics uh, that we all love to talk about and that you're so steeped uh, in knowledge in. So. Thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, thank you very much, Angela.